using machine learning and AI for customer intelligence and real-time personalization marketing. This is a presentation I did at the Eventus Gaming Show in Cyprus in late May 2018. And basically, according to the Global Challenges Foundation, there are 12 threats to humanity. These are threats that um, the GCF believes could wipe the human race off the face of the planet. Besides AI, they are unknown consequences, synthetic biology, extreme climate change, uh, super volcano, global pandemic, ecological collapse, and bad governance, amongst others. But AI is the only one that can actually be used for good, and AI could actually help, potentially help with all of the other 11 um, challenges that humanity is facing. So my point here is AI is a very powerful, um, it is very powerful technology that we also need to be very careful about because it could have consequences that we can't even envision at this point. One of the best quotes that I've read is by uh, Eliza Yudkowski. Uh, he's one of the big AI researchers that is currently doing some very interesting work. I mean, his, his statement is, by far the greatest danger of artificial intelligence is that people conclude too early that they understand it. So um, there are obviously um, other technologies or other changes in, in research that um, people have also concluded too early that they understand it. But this is one in particular that we do need to be careful because we are dealing with something very, very powerful, potentially. So machine learning is a subfield of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. It evolved from the study of pattern recognition. Uh, few techno technological advances complement marketing as well as AI and, and machine learning, and that's what most, a lot of my presentation is about. Playing a key role in everything from data integration to insight generation, AI enables marketers to scale endlessly while never missing an insight. So AI can actually be uh, very powerfully used on the cloud. So um, companies like Ali, Ali, Alibaba through AliCloud, obviously Microsoft, Google, AWS, they're all creating technology on the cloud that can be used to, um, to do some massively complicated um, analytics. And then you're having the ability to scale endlessly by just adding, you know, virtual machines as you need them. So it's it's um it's a great time to be working on both of these um, technologies. And this is um, just an interesting story about um, AlphaGo. It is a company that was purchased by uh, Google recently, and um, they were developing an algorithm that would play the game Go. And Go is unique in that there are more um, options on the board. Um, that can be played, then there are um, atoms in the universe, I believe, because basically there are trillions of um, different ways that you can play according to how your your uh, opponent plays. So AlphaGo, actually, in, I think it was 2017 or 16, um, five years before the AlphaGo researchers thought they could do this, they actually played against the best uh, Go player in the world, um, a man named Lee Sadal from Korea, and beat him four games to one. So the point here is the technology is is um, is moving a lot quicker than even some of the best researchers thought it would be. Um, today, AI is being used by uh, a multitude of companies. Um, even gaming companies now are basically giving computers the control of the keyboard while it's keeping track of the score, the computer learns autonomously with the goal of maximizing the score. So after two hours of play, these computers have become expert players. And that's basically what's happening here with AI. Um, AI has also been used to build and modify websites. Uh, the work is proven to be more accurate than work done by human designers. Amazon is also using AI to do, obviously, you're very familiar with the Amazon recommendations, but they're also you just took out a patent a couple of years ago on something called anticip anticipatory delivery. So they're actually looking at your um, typical orders and the schedule on those orders, and they are expecting you to order. So they're filling up their warehouses or their trucks with what they expect you will be ordering because that's what you have ordered in the past and what they assume you will be ordering in the future. We are creatures of... Um, very similar behavior.
So AI is also, and this is most of what we're going to be talking about today, it's um, been used for personal shopping for everyone, uh, utilizing chatbots to increase customer service. That's been a huge thing uh, right now, and a lot of development is, is, is doing that. So the hope is to cut down on human um, beings and just making it all an AI so that they can handle most customer service problems to whatever particular business it might be. It's also using or being used to see for seamless programmatic media buying and predictive customer service, so we can figure out what is going to be the problem, and then hopefully address it before it has become a problem, or once it becomes a problem, give the customer service people all the information that they need to uh, make decisions on how to improve the service. And it can also optimize marketing automation, and I will explain that in um, some ongoing slides. These are general use cases for AI, and um, it's for a multitude of industries. So what we're looking at here is this, a lot of these are relevant to the gaming and the uh, sports betting industry. Uh, voice recognition, uh, voice search, so some, some telecommunication companies are utilizing voice shirt search so that you can uh, search things just over the phone or via voice, kind of like Alexa and all of those uh, products. Uh, sentiment analysis is very important for CRM, no matter what industry you're in. You're dealing with customers. It's very good to understand what they, uh, issues they might be facing. Floor detection, floor detection, obviously that is very important for the casino industry as well. All the way down to um, image uh, classification, so facial recognition technology that could be useful for the casinos and when someone walks on the floor or on a casino bus, boom, we take a picture of their face and figure out who they are. Figure out where they're going. Um, if there's someone that they're a high roller, that's good. We'll alert some some people in the uh, host department or uh, maybe even, uh, one of the high roller rooms to prepare the table for them. Or it could even be this person is uh, someone associated with someone we don't like or we don't want, so uh, security could be informed. Um, and then there's also photo clustering and machine vision, which is uh, being used in the auto motive aviation industries. And motion detection can also be very useful and uh, real-time threat detection as well. So when it comes to AI and machine learning, this is a timeline that shows basically where we, where we were, or where we've come from in terms of both data and analytics. If you look um, at the turn of the century, we were looking at survey data in the 20s, it became eye tracking, and all the way up to today, or early 2000s, we got search, and we've got clickstream, video, social, and location, which is the latest, and social recognition as well. Um, on the analytics side, we go all the way back to a ANOVA back in probably like 1930s, early 30s, uh, Bayesian decision, which is a very important one for marketing. And in the later, in the, in the late 2000s, or I guess around 2006, was deep learning. Uh, Google's deep neural network was actually uh, created a few years later. Amazon now has their own machine learning tools, and Facebook's deep face is a solution that can actually recognize a human face to an accuracy that is as, as equivalent to a human mind as well. And then AlphaGo, which I just spoke about, is um, some of the latest technology right around 2017. In terms of technology, one of the important things about AI and machine learning is its ability to uh, capture information and utilize that information in in extremely powerful ways. And this is a quote that I read from an interesting article called How Real-Time Marketing Technology Can Transform Your Business. Now, uh, Dan Woods basically says, technology has changed marketing and market research into something less like golf and more like a multiplayer first-person shooter game. Crouch behind a hut, the stealthy marketers dressed in business casual camouflage assess their weapons for sending outbound messages. Email, campaigns, events, blogging, tweeting, PR, ebooks, white papers, apps, banner ads, Google AdWords, social media outreach, social engine optimization. The brave marketer, marketers rise up and blast away using weapons not to kill consumers, but to attract them to their sites, to their offers, to their communities. If the weapons work, you get incoming traffic. So his point is, you know, we've got about 10 to 15 ways in which we communicate both inbound and outbound which is very different to what the world was like in the 90s and even the early 2000s when TV was huge, radio was huge, 
and print was, um, you know, basically the, the three best ways to communicate with people. So now it's, instead of it just being a one-way source to receiver, uh, now it's become two ways where people are communicating back and forth, and they're communicating in 20 different ways. And basically, if you want your marketing to be understood, accepted, and to increase your ROI, more, most importantly, you have to be able to um, join the conversation, be a part of the conversation, start the conversation, and make sure that conversation is relevant to um, the person you are trying to market to or communicate to, because otherwise they're, they're going to jump on another app, find another company that actually does understand them. So with successful mobile advertising, um, there are three things that are required, reach, purity, and analytics. Reach can be fostered by accessing accounts through multiple platforms like blogs, OTT services, mobile apps, push and pull services, RSS feeds, search, social media sites, video casting. Um, purity refers to the message and its cleanliness. Once again, this is where ML and AI become very important. If the data is unstructured and untrustworthy, it's useless. Junk in, junk out, as we love to say in the analytics world. Um, and data governance is paramount if you want any real-time advertising to work. Analytics involves matching users' interest, implicit and explicit context, preferences, network enhancement conditions to ads and promotions in real time. So it's a very complicated world we're delving into. And um, this is what I call the analytic value escalator. And it's um, very important to get, a, a, to get a sense of where we're going in terms of um, AI and ML. So... The start at the bottom, and basically the lower, the easier it is to do. At the end, you're getting towards the optimization, where that is where you can make some very serious ROI, um, uh, very you know, very powerful uh, return on investment. Whereas um, down here at the bottom, you can still it's, it's still very useful, but it just doesn't have the, um, the the value that it will up the front of the top. So the analytics value escalator starts at the bottom with uh, descriptive analytics. So this is basically asking the question, what happened? Um, and an example here would be using Google Analytics to track website traffic. I mean, an interesting uh, example came to me with one of my clients, which is actually in the airline industry, and they had an attendance problem with flight attendants and customer-facing staff, so they were having issues filling um, some of their planes with uh, flight attendants when it would be a national holiday. So they discovered that employees would ask for time off before the holidays, and if they didn't get the time off approved, they just called in sick. So the airline was able to make a nice um, descriptive table that showed their employees who were basically calling in sick even though they weren't sick. So they were able to take that information and show the employees and basically say, please don't do this, we know you're not sick. And um, it's very, very suspicious that you end up being sick on a day that you plan to take off. And the fact that it's a national holiday too is even more so. So um, that was an interesting use of descriptive analytics, I thought. Um, the second one up is a diagnostic analytics. And this basically asks the question, why did it happen? And here you could be mining data to determine what caused a spike in your web traffic over the past month, let's say, you know, if you're a retailer or even a, a casino, maybe people are hitting you up on a particular date that, you know, turned out to be a pretty obvious one. That would be uh, vacations coming up and stuff like that. But there are there are a hundred other ways where you could also use the uh, diagnostic to try to figure out what was going on in your business. Um, predictive analytics, the third step is um, asking the question, what could happen? Here you're using algorithms and data to predict which casino patron are most likely to use a particular offer, let's say, in your marketing. Um, and then the fourth, the top one, is uh, prescriptive analytics, which is what should happen. So here, examples would be using algorithms to optimize such things as table games revenue management, hotel room rates, slot for optimization, and labor utilization. So, um, you know, you could be looking at what are the minimum price hands you should have on your tables, how often they should be, uh, how often the table should be open, what time they should open, what time they should close, um, and stuff like that. So descriptive, uh, prescriptive analytics suggests decision options on how to take advantage of a future opportunity or mitigate or mitigate a future risk and shows the implication of each decision option. Descriptive analytics can continually take in new data, so here's the AI and the ML, 
and this can re-predict and re-prescribe, thus automatically improving prediction accuracy and prescribing better decision options. Now, AI and uh, machine learning is particularly useful for marketers, and I'm going to give an example here of a company that is using AI in a very powerful way. And um, AI basically allows marketers to access data more easily and uncover insights quicker. It allows personalization marketing on a scale entirely uh, unique. Customer analytics has evolved from simply reporting customer behavior to segmenting a customer based on his or her profitability to predicting that profitability to improving those predictions uh, because of the inclusion of new data to actually manipulating customer behavior with target specific promotional offers and context for where marketing campaigns, which I will go into um, in some further uh, slides. These are the channels that AI thrives in, and this is where a sports program or a casino can gain a powerful competitive advantage. There's a company called Fanatics, which is uh, a company in the United States that sells sports gear, um, and they have basically developed an analytics platform that crunches over 200 variables, including Twitter chatter, online advertising data, and sales stats, to figure out which players uh, would become popular before the public catches on. Now, there was a player in America, in American football, a few years ago that was playing in some preseason games, and he's actually a unique story because he's actually uh, he's either Australian or New Zealand, and he played rugby in, in Australia for the Parramatta Eels, but he decided to try his hand at American football, and he actually got quite popular and did a few things that caught the attention of a lot of Twitter followers. So Fanatics was actually able to see the uh, interest in Mr. Jared Hain before um, basically anyone really knew he was going to get so popular. So they were able to load up on his jerseys, and when people started buying them, they were one of the rare uh, websites that um, would have had his jerseys. So it was quite an interesting use of analytics and um, social media sentiment analysis. So they're a company that uses um, to basically determine their inventory levels. They analyze number of searches for any given player on their website, uh, sales on its sites, and clicks on specific journey, uh, jerseys and digital ads. Uh, they're fanatic emails to fans, and they also scrape Facebook and especially Twitter to develop a sentiment analysis for each player that they would be selling um, jerseys for. So Jonathan Wilbur is the director of CRM, uh, CRM for the company, and he says, we want to deliver the most relevant merchandise to you at the right time for your team. If you're a Yankees fan, we want to make sure we're never showing anything Boston Red Sox. And, you know, sport is a very um, emotional, um, uh, you know, we get very emotional about the teams we support. So it's very important. Uh, if you're a Tottenham fan, you don't want to see anything Arsenal. If you're a Manchester United fan, you really don't want to see anything Manchester City. So this is um, a level of personalization that is really required in this day and age. So sports with, sports books would be the same way if someone is is a Manchester United fan, you know, give me bets of only Manchester United or uh, obviously the teams that are going to be playing, but also um, they don't want to see any bets with pictures of players from their rivals. So this is all came from a, an article named Transform Customer Experience by Harnessing the Power of AI in CRM. It's an MIT technology review article that should be available online if anyone wants to delve deeper. Uh, one other quote from it, which is quite interesting, is unlike traditional customer-facing platforms that deliver a fragmented view of the buyer, an intelligent platform, i.e. an AI or an ML platform, presents a single aggregated view of customer data. The built-in intelligence layer helps businesses spot trends, anticipate needs, and respond more proactively. With that complete picture, for example, a, picture no a business knows exactly when the customer last purchased the product, what the product was, whether he or she had a problem, and if so, exactly how it was resolved. Um, the wide range of machine learning models learns from what is collected to unearth and match patterns, as well as act on correlations that would otherwise remain hidden. AI models embedded within the CRM system's personalization engine take into account the catalog that any given shopper sees and the context on how the merchant is engaging with that shopper, and then ranks every product for that buyer in terms of relevance from search results, making the most targeted and personalized results ever. So with AI and ML, this, this AI and ML is required if you want to do this at scale. If you have a, a database of 100,000 customers, you need um, these solutions to be able to do that because shopper recommendations would be impossible without it. So here is basically an image of the 
different types of machine learning that is out there. And I'll go in and I'll drill down into specific examples. But basically, there's three types. You have the supervised learning, the unsupervised learning, and the reinforcement learning. I'll start with the unsupervised learning side. Um, here, it's everything from dimensionality uh, reduction to clustering, which provides recommendation systems, customer segmentation, potential fraud and theft. Um, but basically, with the unstructured, you get the ability to produce data-informed personas. So basically, you are able to look at the entire database of customers that you have, and while you're looking at them, you can find specific uh, individual items that would make them unique. And then you can put all of these unique individuals into particular button, uh, buckets that are drawn a specific way that have certain characteristics in common, and these characteristics, characteristics would then be considered a persona. So you're able to actually look at people in very individual ways, and this is much more effective than telling the software to find a group of people or personas that have a certain characteristic in mind. That would take longer, that would take a lot more computing power. In terms of targeted marketing, uh, unsupervised learning can also be very effective. And if we look at the nature of today's world versus what we were looking at in the 1970s, um, today, I mean, back then, there, the average person was looking at about 300 different advertisements being seen in a day. Now we're looking at something where it's uh, closer to about 5,000. So we're seeing advertisements on television, radio, hearing them on radio. We're seeing them obviously in our apps and just about everywhere we look. So now you're looking at a very cluttered environment, and it's much more difficult to clear, get through the clutter so that people recognize and hear your message. So today, um, AI is going to allow you to get more into cognitive advertising rather than programmatic advertising. And the difference here is when, obviously, anyone who's been online and purchased anything online or even visited a website will notice that um, they, uh, they seem to be leaving a trail and uh, the advertisements seem to follow them. So that's the old programmatic way. Um, if you look for, let's say, a cruise to, through Greece, then every other advertisement you go to is going to show you that little uh, advertisement of that wonderful cruise that you could take in Greece or through the Mediterranean. But with cognitive advertising, we are going to be able to understand the reason why you left a site, how you left it, whether you bought or not. And the system is going to make an informed decision on whether um, to serve you ads or not. Here's another quote from that article that I mentioned earlier. One of the, and it's a very directly um, relatable to the, the problems that we're currently facing in the marketing world. So one of the biggest problems in corporate marketing is hitting the customer with automated marketing offers too often. In the future, AI will analyze a consumer's purchase history and email habits to choose the optimal time for hitting the inbox with contents that's bound to boost open rates and conversions. So how are they going to do this? So here's an example of what is currently uh, the differences between some naive marketing to AI-powered marketing. So the example here is it's 3 p.m. On, um, on a Thursday. You've got a market to about 30,000 30, customers, and what are the choices that you have? The first would be the naive way. It's 3 p.m. I still have time. I'll just I'll get it out. So he's not really worrying too much about it. The somewhat informed way is I've read an article recently, uh, and it says that Monday is the best day for um, for click through rates. So there's higher rates on Monday. Perhaps that's because um, everyone's at work and um, they they have access to email that is a lot more or on systems that are a lot more powerful than they have at home. So the idea is here. I'll wait until Monday to send uh, those emails out. The data powered way would be we know the time zones of our subscribers so we'll send the messages out during the business hours for each particular individual however the best way the ai powered way is to let the system decide what the best time for each individual is based on all of the data that it has available to it so basically you're saying here is the goal i want to send the email out at the optimum time for the person to open the email so once he opens it you can see our marketing message and obviously opening is the very first level of him responding to the message so 
basically, based on all the available data, you're letting the system decide when to send the email out. Now, perhaps our customer typically opens his email at 7 p.m., so the system learns that and then sends the offer out of the at that time. If you want to add social media channels, perhaps he opens um, after he tweets. You know, maybe that's a sense that he's now at home or he's got his, his uh, phone with him or he tweets from his PC at home. So that's the time that he normally opens emails. So the system now watches something like Twitter and looks for, it watches his feed and once he tweets, fires off the offer. So, so this is the, the, the way that we are moving into, this is the world of personalization marketing that I believe you have to start embracing. Uh, regarding fraud and theft, on unsupervised learning, you can create models that do not, provide, uh, do not require previous tags and rely on outlier detection to find aberrant behavior that's indicative of fraud. So this starts with an understanding of the archetype of a peer group and looking at all the transactions. And within those transactions, it's going to, spot, it's going to try to spot something that is outside the norm. Unsupervised models are very uh, handy in situations where there is a lack of fraud examples. And if you look at the way um, fraud and, um, and you know the world of uh, hacking is going these days, it's very in many ways the first time you will see something is when it's been done, and it's too late to actually get um, an example of it because once you have the example, the money has been stolen. And these models actually continually adapt. Um, traditional neural network fraud models are. Um, exceptionally good in response to real-time fraud tactics, some of which may not have been present during model training. So even in the training phase didn't see something, um, the AI and the neural network can actually spot something that is aberrant. This ability also gives it um, the power to learn, and um, so it is going to start recognizing things, and it is going to adapt and change as time goes by. Now, recommendation systems are also a very important uh, element in unsupervised learning. Uh, Fanatics actually is interesting because they send out about 3.5 billion messages uh, a year. So when a team wins the Super Bowl, they can have 350 products live with the press of a button three seconds after the game. Um, they have built scripts that search customer data to display fans' favorite teams, pulled in real-time scores and stats from vendor feeds, and personalized branding using partner IDs. So these are all the uh, data sources and data points that they are using. They're even building uh, automatically triggered rules-driven campaigns based on dynamic information. So anytime, for example, if a baseball player, if I'm a fan of the Baltimore Orioles and a baseball player hits three home runs in that game in a game, then Fanatics sends out an email featuring his jersey to fans of that team. So that you know you're primed to be happy when something like that happens. So Fanatics is figuring why not, um, why not try to sell a jersey at that moment too. And this is an example too where, this is a perfect example for casinos and sports, I mean for sports books, because when Cristiano Ronaldo hits three goals um, against Spain at the World Cup, then people are very happy with him and the Portuguese are obviously going to feel a lot more, uh, or feel a lot more uh, willing to purchase products that are of uh, Portuguese teams. So. So many AI systems enable natural language learning and voice input, such as Siri and Alexa. This allows a CRM system to answer queries, solve problems, and even identify new opportunities for the sales team. Um, you could actually use uh, AI natural language learning to be answering questions on a customer service system that would then be able to take those answers and um, provide the um, customers with particular intelligence according to what they're asking for. So. Some AI-driven CRM systems can even multitask to handle all of these functions and more. Uh, the North Face actually is interesting because they're using IBM's uh, Watson, which it enables online shoppers to discuss, uh, discover their perfect jacket. Um, so the system is going to be asking where and when would you be using this jacket. Through voice input, it is going to be able to scan hundreds of products that will meet the match of what the item, what the consumers are looking for based on real-time customer input and its own research. So they'll be able to look at the, the weather, time of year, and all available options can be given, or the best options, I should say. Uh, on the supervised learning side, 
Supervised learning, um, AI can monitor specific and personalized gaming patterns and changes in behavior over a period of time to assess whether a player is developing a gambling problem or not. Uh, you can build models that detect problem gambling behavior and then call through your database to find gamblers with similar traits. Um, in terms of image classification, the use of deep neural networks and image classifiers can analyze images on a sports book website, let's say, and it can help the sports book marketers monitor images that provide the highest selling and conversion rates through each. 2017 images of things they want. So this may be less important on the um, sports betting side and the casino side perhaps, but image recognition does allow retailers to present similar products and complementary to the ones being searched for. So this is, this is um, another use of image recognition. It can also help with identifying key purchasing patterns. Um, if we look at human beings, they're not always, um, they're, they're, their decisions don't always make uh, sense or have logic. Emotion, trust, communication skills, culture, and intuition plays a big role in our buying decisions. And the research that has been done right now on the human brain is we're actually discovering that there are three brains in a human. The new brain, the middle brain, and the reptilian brain. So deciding which brain to target in a company's advertising campaign is almost as important as deciding on the content of those campaigns. Neuromarketing is tapped into the incredible potential of um, fMRI imaging, which is giving us deep, uh, deep view into human behavior and consumer habits. The problem here is it's an enormous amount of data. So we are um, developing personas on people and, and figuring out which brain is the one you want to target to. Oftentimes it is the reptilian one, um, but the studies and the uh, necessity of power, of computing power, of data power, um, is only available now that we are using AI. Supervised learning can also help with customer worth. Um, when you're dealing with customer loyalty, every touch point that a customer is um, communicating with you has to be collected, analyzed, um, every email, every visit. Per um, you know, when you're talking about purchases, it's not just on the casino floor, it can also be um, so you're basically dealing with data sets that are thousands of columns wide and millions of rows deep, and humans would, would not be able to compute that. So we do need technology like AI to get us to the point where we understand what is going on. So reinforcement learning is another very important uh, third wheel, I guess, third spoke of the um, machine learning technology. And on the, on the marketing side, AI may deliver that extra dash of relevancy programmatic advertising has been waiting for all these years. On the consumer side, AI helps create individual display ads that website visitors might want to see. While on the accounting side, these bots can handle invoicing and payment for these ad transactions and give marketers more time to focus on the big picture. And the point there is also, one of the points there is also that uh, AI and ML can give people the ability to Take the grunt work away from your um, employees. So marketers really and analysts just want to analyze the data. They don't want to clean up the data. They don't want to spend all their time um, building these models. AI, machine learning can build models and then build models on top of models on top of models. And, and we want to look at the results and figure out what's going on from those results. So bots are also extremely important. Uh, Facebook Messenger is one of the better technologies out there. Um, and this is also reinforcement learning, so you can actually teach a bot uh, to answer particular information and deliver personalized product recommendations. So it's a very effective way to cut down on, on the customer service reps and just create the bot that can answer these questions. And, Obviously, the more you go on, the more technology and time you spend doing this, the better because you'll get to the point where you'll build up big databases of um, question and answers and uh, intelligence for even about your business. Game AI is also something that uh, needs to be taken, um, looked at very cautiously. Um, there was an example of a woman actually who was um, living in Texas and she teamed up with the a uh, person who owned a store that was selling scratchets, so like um, selling millionaire scratch-off games. And basically what the woman did was she 
She had a degree from Stanford in analytics and statistics, actually. And she teamed up with the store owner and bought a certain set of um, these cards. And she hit the million dollar jackpot about four times, basically because she was able to figure out the code. So random number generators are very good for humans because we don't have the mental capacity to figure out the algorithms, but computers and AI and machine learning has the capacity to do that. So just um, one needs to be careful and one should have that on one's radar. Um, in skills acquisition, it can also be very useful. If the training is being facilitated through an online portal, AI can collect information on how long employees linger in the portal, how often they log on to review materials, the success rate of quizzes and the completion rate of certificate certifications. AI can also help determine whether employees are watching the video lesson in one sitting or stopping part way through. Um, while AI can improve the overall training process for employees, measurable results from the training can also be collected. For instance, in addition to tracking the rate at which employees complete their compliance training, such as food and safety, food safety and sexual harassment courses, AI can monitor whether or not violations and complaints are decreasing or increasing in the workplace. In terms of real-time decisioning, um, match fixing is a huge problem within the sports betting and the professional sports leagues. Interpol estimates the volume of illegal betting and match fixing to be worth about $500 billion on the Asian markets. Focus on its investigation is uh, particular Southeast Asian countries and China, like Malaysia, Vietnam, Singapore, and Thailand. Um, the Match fixing has been found in the German Bundesliga as well as the Italian League. And there was an interesting article written entitled Preliminary Study to Detect Match Fixing Benefits Law in Badminton Rally Data. Uh, Park et al. Just argue that match fixing has emerged as a social problem that threatens the presence of modern sports itself. And they're looking at Benefits Law, which um, is a law that refers to the phenomenon in which as the first digit of a number increases from 1 to 9. The occurrence rate of this number reduces, as the rate of the first digit being 1 is about 30%, that of 2 is 17.61%, and 9 is about 4.58%. So, according to Park et al., Benford proved the fact that the numbers starting with 1 are more specifically distributed among the numbers that are used every day, such as the area of a lake, demographics, mortality statistics, and numbers appearing in newspapers. And these numbers follow a unique rule called Benford's Law. Here's a distribution that kind of shows you Benford's Law in action. Um, so we're looking at first digit distribution. So if the rally was 11 uh, strokes long, it would be a 1. If the rally was 5 strokes long, it would be a 5. If the rally was 30 long, it would be a 3. So we're taking the first digit here. And in the case of, um, in the case of men's, women's, singles, men's, doubles, women's, doubles, and mixed doubles, it's all very, very... Um, evenly distributed in Benford's Law is actually shown in these uh, numbers. So there were two famous matches that were um, provably um, match fixing. And these occurred at the 2012 London Olympics. They were so bad actually that the refs, you know, the ref came out and said, stop this behavior. And basically the te one of the teams, the Chinese team wanted to lose in order to get a better seating in the or to avoid a particular team in the following um, in, the, in the following round. I think they didn't want to play a Chinese team, so they, they tried to lose against a South Korean team, and it was so farcical that they were just popping shots, uh, popping, popping shots into the net as, instead of serving properly and then letting the ball drop and land in. And the crowd booed um, and basically the game was so farcical that the referee warned the players to improve their performance after the first set. They did, but even in the second set, it was it was, it was still ridiculous. Um, they were actually uh, four, four, eight players, four teams were actually kicked out of the Olympics because of that. So Benford, uh, so Parkadal looked at these numbers, and they were able to prove that the distribution was nothing like this. So their theory was, let's look at a real-time feed coming in on something like tennis or badminton will actually be able to figure out if the if the game is being fixed or not because the play is not proper. So they're also saying that whether the record such as the distance covered or time taken for a soccer player to sprint during the game um, can also be looked at, the number of touches to the ball while dribbling and the number of passes of the ball during something like a basketball game. These could all fall under Benford's law and 
obviously the additional work and research and study needs to be done on this, but their argument is there may be a way to use Ben Bush law to predict match fixing. Obviously with tennis and other racket sports it would be pretty easy, um, but now, there are other ways as well to use AI to basically watch a particular player and then see what his personality was game-wise. And then if he deviates from that, then we could say there's something wrong. Either he's doing it on purpose or maybe he's got a physical ailment or something like that. So so in terms of deep learning, which is um, another, another type of AI and ML, um, this is something that was developed by Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. And these companies are opening their technology to any and all in an attempt to increase AI and ML knowledge. So there's a large and active community growing up around some solutions that they have developed. TensorFlow is a very interesting one that has been open sourced by Google lately. And it is part of, an, of their AI engine. Sharing some of the algorithms that run atop the engine is what uh, Google is now doing. Um, it's not sharing access to the remarkably advanced hardware infrastructure that drives this engine, but they are allowing people to download and open so and use the software for free um, on their by, on one server. So um, it is quite a generous offer on their part. Cafe 2 is primarily designed to be used in production and not for research. And this is a Facebook produced um, uh, deep learning technology and uh, they want Cafe2 to be the go-to option if one wants to deploy deep learning on mobile devices. So if you wanted to do any image recognition in a casino, let's say, or even on a on a sports booking, a sports book app, that would be a good choice. Um, Keras is also another deep learning library that sits atop TensorFlow and provides an intuitive API inspired by Torch, which is another one that Facebook developed. Um, and then there's a fourth company called Deep Learning that is the first commercial grade open source distributed deep learning library, which is written in uh, written for Java and Scala. And it's integrated with Hadoop and Apache Spark, which is the real time stream processing engine that um, Apache created. And it um, brings AI to business environments for use on distributed GPUs and CPUs. Uh, Kaggle is also an interesting platform. This was actually recently purchased by Google. And it is a platform for data science competition. So if you were interested in creating a competition to say, do a modern day customer segmentation, then you can put up a, which is something actually I think uh, Caesar did recently, but you can put up a competition, put up some money, and basically some of the world's best uh, PhD analysts are on this platform and they're all vying to be you know, basically to win the competition. So, and you'll end up with the code and you'll end up with um, probably a pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, Singularity Net is also, I um, shouldn't say raising money, it apparently closed its round in seconds. Um, but they want to create a decentralized marketplace for AI. Um, ben Gertzel is the uh, founder of the company and he wants to bring AI and blockchain together to create a decentralized open market for AIs. Uh, the implications are that it could let anyone monetize AI, allowing companies, organizations, and developers to buy and sell AI algorithms at scale. So why do you want to get into uh, AI and machine learning? Well, seven times uh, global consumers are seven times more likely to see a positive than a negative impact of AI on society and their personal lives. 55% of CMOs are expecting AI to have a greater impact on marketing and communication than social media ever did. And they had a huge uh, marketing um, they, they change marketing quite radically. And 69% of CMOs report their company is planning um, or doing something or, or doing or planning for business in the AI era. So um, ways that you can do it, we can um, build some bots very simply. According to Gartner, these customers today don't want you to put humans in their way if they could complete a task on their own. They don't see the need for another person to be involved in technology so rarely fails them. So these are the millennials and the Gen Xs. And, and uh, so anytime you can limit human beings, uh, the better. Third one, Amazon Folly is an interesting text to speech option, which I will actually be using to change, to translate some of my, some of these, so to translate this into another language. And basically the literacy is pretty bad in a lot of countries. Um, for example, in the US, 21%. US, the U.S. adults read below a fifth grade level, and 19% of high school graduates can't read. 
Um, a Fantastic Woman is the Oscar winner last year for foreign language films. And one of the sad, the sad truths of America is a lot of there's there's there isn't a lot of value in foreign movies because it's not because the Americans don't uh, understand second languages; it's because they can't read their own first language. So. Um, and in terms of CRM, going back to Dan Woods' quote about the email campaigns, the events, the bloggings, the tweetings, the PR, social media outreach, search and engine optimization, um, these are all ways that you have to connect with people if you want to connect with them where they want to be connected with. So associating social accounts with customer accounts will drive personalization and connect with, uh, will help you connect with users on the channels that they want to be connected on. And in terms of, if you look at this graph here, you can see the monthly active users for four social networks and the messaging apps. There's a, I mean, not quite a hockey stick growth on the social messaging apps like uh, the WeChats and the WhatsApp, but you can see they're actually radically um, going ahead of the social networking apps. So these are the places that obviously um, consumers want to be connected with. And uh, just as one last funny quote, um, I just wanted to pick up one of my favorite quotes on AI and before we work on artificial intelligence, why don't we work, why don't we do something about natural stupidity from uh, Steve Polyak. So anyway, that is the end of the um, discussion. I've written two books on the subject for the casino and sports betting industry. And uh, if you look here, um, if you scan the red QR code, that'll give you the Amazon Kindle. And if you scan the blue, QR code, then you will get a link to this Prezi. So anyway, thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to email me at andrew.pearson at intelligentsia.co. And um, hope you enjoyed this. There will be more. So keep an eye on my YouTube channel.